April 4th, 1945. Weary but triumphant American troops surge into Nazi Germany as the Third Reich begins to crumble. In just four weeks, the war will be over. But what these soldiers discover this dreary spring day will live on. Many had experienced the horrors of war since their march from the beaches of Normandy, but they have no idea what is in store for them. While searching for secret Nazi communications, units of the U.S. Third Army accidentally discover Buchenwald, a prisoner camp containing emaciated men and rotting corpses. Of the 250,000 who had lived and slaved at Buchenwald, only 4,000 Jewish prisoners were left, barely alive. On the edge of the camp was a gigantic pit where the Nazis had stacked bodies and burned them. The smell emanating from discarded, decaying flesh, burning bodies, and an open concrete ditch that served as the latrine was unbearable. Throughout Germany and other occupied countries, liberators confronted unspeakable conditions in the Nazi camps, where piles of corpses lay unburied. Only after the liberation of these camps was the full scope of Nazi horrors exposed to the world. The small percentage of inmates who survived resembled skeletons because of the demands of forced labor and the lack of food, compounded by months and years of maltreatment. Most were so weak that they could hardly move, and many died within days of their emancipation. These recordings stand as a historical testament to the Nazi atrocities. Still today, there are many who deny the breadth and width of the Holocaust. Despite the mountains of evidence and endless testimonials to its horrors, the number of deniers continues to grow. So how could 20th century Germany, one of the most highly civilized and highly educated countries in modern history, have created these factories of death? How could Christians and other people of conviction have just stood by and let it happen? And if more of us deny it, then how soon will we allow it to happen once again? As we move closer to forgetting history, we move closer to repeating it. Six million men, women, and children crying out from their graves. Do not forget us. Hello, I'm Lori Cardoza Moore, president of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating Christians about their biblical responsibility to the Jewish people. Many do not realize that the word explicitly tells us to stand with our Jewish brethren and defend the land God calls his. The program you're about to watch will look not only at the why and how of the Holocaust, but more importantly, why did Christians stand by and let not only six million Jews be murdered, but close to another five million unwanted people as well? How could Christians have turned a blind eye to the genocidal state around them? Are we turning away again? Are we bound to make the same mistakes and carry on the false perceptions of our past? For me and for many of us, 9-11 was a wake-up call. The world of the suicide bomber and terrorism had found us unprepared and sleeping. Worldwide, we see a growing attack on both the legitimacy and security of the State of Israel, as well as violent assaults on the safety of our Jewish brethren everywhere. In Europe, men and women who bear the tattoos of concentration camps Look out on a continent where Jewish lives and Jewish property are under attack, and public debate is poisoned by an anti-Semitism we thought was no more. In Iran, we see a regime that backs Hezbollah and Hamas, and a leader who vows to wipe Israel from the map. A terrorist state that is now on course to acquire a nuclear weapon. Israel's six million Jews are in danger from total annihilation. 
could we be witnesses to the next Holocaust? In India, we see Islamic terrorists single out the Mumbai Jewish Center in a well-planned attack that appears to be a test run for similar attacks around the world. Similar to the Nazi party propaganda of the 30s, Jews today are blamed for many ills and social injustices, such as the 9-11 attacks, the Iraq War, and the recent economic collapse. Since 2001, over 9,000 rockets and mortars have been fired into Israel from sites in Gaza and Lebanon by Hamas and Hezbollah. But each time Israel moves to protect her citizens, the cry of war crimes rings from the world. The U.S., once Israel's greatest ally, is now putting greater pressure on Israel to give away land, a move that could prove suicidal for the Jewish state. In 2004, the British Parliament set up an inquiry into anti-Semitism. The inquiry stated that until recently, the prevailing opinion, both within the Jewish community and beyond, had been that anti-Semitism had receded to the point that it existed only on the margins of society. It found an alarming reversal of this progress since 2000. A report from the U.S. State Department from March 14, 2008 detailed an upsurge across the world of anti-Semitism. And more recently, in America, we are witnessing increasing violent attacks on our Jewish communities. Of the six and a half billion people on this planet, roughly 14 million are Jewish. That's about 0.1% of the world's population. So why is there such hatred for this small and seemingly insignificant group of people in this tiny country called Israel? Hitler and the Nazis did not invent anti-Semitism, but when his final solution came along, the people were prepared to believe the evil propaganda. Christian teachings didn't lead to Auschwitz, but it made it a lot easier. The roots of this hate have traveled long and go deep. Anti-Semitism, often called the longest hatred, has many manifestations. From individual expressions of hatred and discrimination, to organized violent mob attacks, called pogroms, to the most extreme form of anti-Semitism, genocide, as seen under Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany. Down through the ages, the Jews have been blamed for virtually every sickness, subversion, socio-economic failure, or world war. Blaming the Jews has been a long-standing Gentile tradition. It goes all the way back to the time of Haman, the prime minister of Persia, who said there's a people among us whose customs are not like ours, and it is not in the best interest of the king to tolerate them, so therefore they should be removed. And then we can see down through history continual manifestations of the spirit of anti-Semitism to say that this people, because they are different, needs to be eradicated. This people needs to be removed. It's not in our best interest to tolerate them. And so it has continued, and it continues to this day. Adolf Hitler based much of his hatred in his book Mein Kampf upon Luther's writings, as well as those of Ford, eugenicists, and Islamic text. The centuries of anti-Semitism that were widespread and deeply ingrained in the European people was fertile ground for the propaganda of the Nazi party. Using the powerful new medium of film, the Nazis spread their lies through Germany and Europe like wildfire. With triumph of the will, the myths of the invincible and godlike Third Reich became cinematic art. Other powerfully persuasive films, such as The Eternal Jew, promoted the misconceptions and lies long held about the Jewish people, as well as adding some of their own. Films, books, newspapers, billboards, all steadily fed the German people anti-Semitic propaganda. Many things that run contrary to Nazi doctrine were depicted to be associated with Jewish influence, such as pornography, socialism, as well as cultural relativism. Jews quickly became the scapegoat for all Germany's ills. They thought and believed and taught that the Jews were a subhuman species. And so therefore they were, uh, they could be eradicated just like one would eradicate vermin. 
that were bringing ill on society. Judaism never defined itself as a race. For us, it's not the genes, it's not the ethnicity that counts. It's the values and the lifestyle. By 1942, Germany had become a genocidal state with every part of the country's bureaucracy involved in the killing process. Not one social group, not one religious community, not one scholarly institution or professional association in Germany and throughout Europe declared its solidarity with the Jews. This made the Holocaust distinctive because anti-Semitic policies were able to unfold without the interference of counterforces. Never before had a state with the authority of its responsible leader decided and announced that a specific human group, including its aged, its women, and its children, would be killed as quickly as possible. One of the prime ministers of Israel made an interesting statement, uh, Menachem Begin. He said, if anyone tells you they're going to kill the Jews, believe them. In 1922, Adolf Hitler made a famous speech in Munich where he said, I want to kill all the Jews in Munich, hang them from the gallows, tell their bodies, provide a stench throughout the community, and then I'm going to go to every city in Germany and do the same thing. And everyone dismissed him. He's just a politician. He's making a fiery speech. Why did the Christians welcome him? Why were there so many Christen Deutschen that supported Adolf Hitler, the majority of Christians. The slaughter was systematically conducted in all areas of Nazi-occupied territory and what are now 35 separate European countries. It resulted in the mass extermination of six million Jews, more than a third of the world's Jewish population. As Hitler and the Nazi party rose to power in 1933, many church groups in Germany supported the new government for several reasons. The Nazis claimed that they would support positive Christianity. Many Christians, especially Catholics, were violently opposed to Soviet communism and its anti-religion ideology. They believed that the Nazis would suppress the spread of communism, and many Christians supported the Nazis' anti-Jewish stance. Nearly 2,000 years of persecution carried a tide of hatred to a level never seen before. They used uh, past statements by Christian scholars and theologians, including Martin Luther, as an excuse uh, for some of the things that they did. They also quoted from other Greek fathers and Latin fathers of the church and statements that they made against the Jewish people. But those were only excuses. Those were only things that were used as a means of trying to justify what they were doing. And by the way, there were German theologians at the time of Hitler that were supportive of what he was doing and justified what he was doing as well. In July 1933, the Vatican signed a Reich Concordant with Nazi Germany, which stated that the Vatican recognized the political legitimacy of Nazi Germany in exchange for a guarantee that the Nazis would not interfere with Catholic institutions and schools. The Pope refused to directly condemn the Nazis in his pronouncements but supported the rescue of Jews from behind the scenes. Catholic clergy in Italy played a very large role in hiding Italian Jews. The German Protestant Church split. Supporters of the Nazis, called German Christians, were prepared to follow the Nazis' orders at all costs. Historians tell us that Germany is the beginnings of the Protestant faith. But in spite of the great Christian tradition, and even as historians talk about a, a high level of civilization, the Holocaust was in Germany. And we say, did Christian teachings in any way contribute to what we say in Hebrew, the Shoah, the storm, the Holocaust? So I think if we're going to be honest as Christians who want to be true to history and look for important changes, we'd have to say there, there is a tradition of history of contempt. The reason that that happened is I believe that we abandoned the roots of our faith, the foundations of our faith in ancient Israel. It really was happening already in Rome when Paul wrote his letter.
because when he wrote his letter to the church in Rome, he said, don't choose the path of arrogance. Remember, it's the root that nourishes the branch. And what have we done? We have cut off the branch we're sitting on in history. Opponents of the Nazis created a breakaway church called the Confessing Church, but only a small group of confessing Christians made active efforts to hide Jews or help them escape the country. As a rule, the church was more interested in protecting itself and its members than in saving Jews. Thus, the church and Christians were silent, both during the issuing of the Nuremberg Laws of 1935 and the massive Kristallnacht pogrom of November 1938. After the war, both the Catholic and Protestant churches admitted the fact that Christians had not done enough to help the Jews during the Holocaust. While the Holocaust was occurring in Germany and, and other parts of Europe, Christians largely stood by silently. The Nazis were so vicious and uh, so controlling with the, with the SS and their uh, treating of their own German people that people were in fear. They lived in total fear for their own lives. And so it took a, a real measure of courage for people to stand up and to stand against what they were doing. When the world is being threatened by extremist Islam, the world is being threatened by terrorist murder squads in a global village where one madman can destroy the world with nuclear weaponry requires a return to the religion of morality, to a God of love. We're less than 13 million Jews. There are close to two billion Christians. Unless we join hands with the Christians who join us in belief in a God of love and morality and peace, there's no hope for the free world. Today, I think there's something about Israel that brings Christians and Jews together in a common cause and a common relationship, that they're strengthening one another and helping one another. If our friend you think loves us too much, accept it as a blessing and as a gift. There are so many in the world that hate us too much, that don't think we have any right to be in Israel at all. If there is an evangelical community that loves us a little too much for your liking, accept it as a very beautiful gift. The whole world is benefiting from the technology, the educational advances, so many vital contributions that Israel as a country is making to the world community today. We can't settle for what's politically expedient or what's economically expedient for our countries we have to settle on the basis of what's right, what's moral, what we should do uh, in relationship to the Jewish people based on what is social justice. Standing for right always costs you. There's a price to pay. But you have to be prepared to do that. And you have to be prepared in your Christian consciousness before events begin to unfold or otherwise you can just be swept up in them and you just close your eyes and you hope for the best and you don't speak out and you don't do anything. And then in retrospect, you look back and you see the atrocity and the evil and you say, if I had only. The Jewish people are our people. We're connected, we're related. The truth is that Israel is the land of the Bible. If we claim to be the people of the land of the Bible, then that land is our land as well. We don't own it, we don't have title to it, but we should view that land as being a part of our heritage, that we as Christians, our faith was birthed in that land among that people. So the question should not be, why should Christians support Israel, but why should they not? In Galatians 3.29, the Apostle Paul said, If you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. What most Christians have never been taught is that when God made that promise to Abraham, 
he made that promise to Abraham and his descendants forever. He also promised that he would make Abraham's descendants like the stars of the heavens and the sands on the seashore. And he said, Abraham, all that land I'm showing you, I'm giving it to you and your descendants forever. Of all the people in the world who should understand who the Jewish people are and who Israel is, it should be the Christians. Of all the people groups around the world, Christians should be standing up, crying out against the atrocities that are being perpetrated against the Jewish people on a daily basis. God told the prophet Joel in chapter 3 that in the latter days, he was going to pour out his wrath on the nations because they were dividing up his land. 300 million Americans, 80% profess to be Christians. But year after year, administration after administration, we allow our government to implement policies that are diametrically opposed to the Word of God. And the reason why we do it? Most Christians don't know the truth. We cannot let our Jewish brethren fight this battle alone. They have fought this battle alone for years with no one standing with them. Now it's time for Christians to rise up. Now it's time for us to take a stand. Now it's time for us to say, never again. The Forgotten People, Christianity and the Holocaust is available now on DVD at PJTN.org. Forgotten.